This podcast contains adult language, descriptions of violence, sexual references, and other possibly offensive themes. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to this episode of Back to the Story, where friends come together to play Dungeons and Dragons. I'll be your DM, Klaus. Let's get started. How do three paladins of separate gods... But if you ask me what my calling would be, I'd say that of a defender of my friends. I would give my life to see them through. I could have, but I didn't. And every day has been beautiful since. I think I'm surrounded by good things. A cleric on a hunt for redemption. I need it for my friends, family, these people that I love, who have always been the answers to my prayers. Whatever the hell you are. I don't know if deserving has anything to do with anything. A storyteller. And if you ever need me ever again, let me know. And one I haven't figured out yet. I think that would take me a while to find someone more knowledgeable than me. All come together. And there's not a bit of fate in that. I think you mispronounced friends. Well, I will drink to that. When you see God's rest surrounded by armies, then know that his desolation has come near. Take these wings to Nymanet. Carry them home. (sighs) All right. Well, recording, we will start. Episode 47, Matron of the Mines. Birds and insects sing through the hot jungle. Ruins of something massive rise from it towards the sun. We see an armed half orc looking over the shoulder of a mustachioed halfling who is using a brush to gently remove dirt from a stone tablet. What is it? Well, it's clearly... I'm not sure, actually. Ancient, but I've not seen the symbology before. We see this, the tablet contains the depiction of a humanoid form. Right hand forming a circle with the thumb and middle finger. Left hand extended to the side, holding a blade. There are no details of the face, no mouth, nose, or eyes, and from the head sprouts a circle. Inside are three markings. A halo, perhaps, though I'm not sure what these three are. The scholar flips through their notes. This text at the bottom should translate phonetically to... Tribus? A dot suddenly sinks into the scholar's neck, his eyes bulging and veins turning black from the poison. His last sight is upon the stone tablet in that voided face. Remembrance of Scala Elaneo Corsar. Previously, as the bronze scales continue in pursuit of the rogue assassin, they came upon a sentient kelp who offered a deal, a memory in exchange for passage through. After considering how to deal with the kelp, the bronze scales decided to forego fighting for now, with Ezekiel giving a memory before moving forward, sending a serpent in case the message wasn't clear. Continuing forward, the scales came upon a hallway leading to a rubble dead end and a hole. Descending through the hole, the scales dropped into a still, cool, and dark lake. Something created a wake of the waters, but you all managed to get to the shore first. Searching for signs, you found evidence of the rogue traveling into the untouched mines, finding an apparently crushed-to-death dragonborn before being ambushed by tentacled monstrosities and their blinding darkness. Killing them, you moved forward with the spider scout, finding apparently a nest of dark mantles and one large dark mantle matron. Attacking through darkness, you fought and destroyed the monster, leaving Ball in a furious storm of cinder and flames before he eventually calmed down. We come back to the story here. A few moments have passed in the abandoned mines and the smell of burning fills the air. Ezekiel has managed to destroy a number of the mantle eggs before his flaming sphere subsided. The dark silence fills the air once more, and the shadows begin to crowd around you. What would you like to do? Is everybody okay? Ezekiel will brush the now soot that has become a part of his fur cloak and say, Yep, yep, fine. Everything's good. Can we sit down for a minute? Yeah. I'll finally let go of Ball's hand and start getting my healing supplies out. Who looks bad? You've already used your healer feet on me, but I can take okay. a medic if we're right. sitting down That's for a short rest. Yeah, mostly going to focus on. We still have Beacon of Hope, right? 
I mean, for like 30 seconds. It's not a long spell. No, it's not. Okay. <laughs> I'll say you get like one round of it, essentially. Whatever you Great. get in one round. Who looks really, really bad? <laughs> Me. Okay, I will... Uh, oh, I can't do that on Ezekiel. Fuck. <laughs> Who besides Ezekiel looks really, really bad? I don't remember the ball yet. I'll do it tomorrow, since I'm right next to him. So. That will be use my healer's kit. And he will regain 1d6. Really just jump right back into the dice pile. Uh, you will regain for you 16 hit points. Thank you. Yeah. Wait, if that's the beacon of hope, then he gets all of them. You're right. You're right. That's the whole point of (laughs) doing it really quick. Come on. (laughs) Listen. (laughs) It's been two weeks. I was just going to say, it's been two weeks. Okay, you get 18 hit points back. (laughs) And then I can go around and medic feed everybody, I think. Which is the full hit die of healing. So you have one, two, three, four, five, six with me included. Yep. So that's uh one success for we'll say ball since I'm already here. Another success for Ezekiel. Uh, another success for Samson. Uh Vesper, out of curiosity, what's the number you have to beat for this and what is your bonus at now, Miss Expertise? <laughs> uh I have to beat a fifteen. And my bonus is at nine, so I'm pretty much All good. Right. Unless I roll really shitty. I was like, are we are we still rolling when it's not even worth it? Pointless? Like, can you roll a one and still get it? Uh, no, I, yeah, I just failed on mine, so we're good. Everybody else, though, can get it. <laughs> <laughs> I just rolled a five because someone jinxed me. Thank you. Ooh, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> it's literally impossible to... Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The lowest number I could possibly roll to still... Anyways, yep. Yeah. Uh, everybody else can take a full hit die feeling, though. So you guys spend the next hour patching your wounds with Vesper going to each of you, helping to heal any wounds using salves and whatever else is in her medical kit. Um, as you are in this cavern room, the bodies of Dark Mantle, some of them burned, and numerous Dark Mantle egg sacks. The burning uh, sphere got a lot of them, but there are still a number more that weren't um, completely destroyed. As you'll spend this hour recovering and resting. Hey, do you think our target might have gotten eaten by this thing? Do you want me to dig? Uh. Do we have any evidence to suggest such a thing? Well, either he found some way to fly through here, or crawl on the walls or something, which is quite possible. Or, or he, he got picked up in the tunnel. I mean, he also might just not have made as much noise as I did when we came down here. And might just they might have been asleep. But well, uh, his I can foot his stomach steps, open. His footsteps disappeared, which is why I'm wondering. Oh, right. That was weird. But that's an effect that happens when I use Pass Without Trace. If he has similar magics, we Uh, don't leave footprints behind. Okay. But regardless, I can cut open its belly and see if there's anything in there worth taking a peek at. And I will take off my cloak, and I'm going to get all hands deep in Dark Mantle Mama guts. All right, roll me a survival check. Yes, sir. As you take in some sort of blade and <laughs> cut in, <laughs> begin sawing through it. The outside is thick. It's like cartilage almost. Um, and it takes a while to cut into it, but you're eventually able to move towards it. You see the maw in the underneath where the tentacles are with sharp teeth, rows of them. It's like numerous replacement teeth that are just following in line like a shark. You eventually cut through and move towards the where you imagine the inside of the stomach might be, the smell is horrendous as it comes out. The smell of rotted flesh comes out, and you begin to pull out pieces and chunks. Give me a constitution save. I'm being so close. I'm dealing with the smell. 16. Okay. You channel that animal instinct where the smell doesn't bother you, and you continue to dig in, and you find a chunk bigger than the others, uh, enough to maybe try to identify it, and you pull it out. And feel in the rest, and there's other smaller pieces, but nothing big enough to really tell what it is. The chunk you do pull out is 
maybe two, two and a half feet long, maybe a foot wide. And you start messing with it, trying to figure out what it is. And you feel chitinous material on it. You, it could be armor, but as you flip it over and start to look at it, it looks like it was some sort of insect that the creature devoured. Taking another look with that survival check, you see the inside of the stomach doesn't have much else in there. Certainly nothing big enough to identify this is the biggest junk. Let's say it eats some sort of large insects. All right. I think we can safely say that he is not in there. Uh, everyone keep an eye out. If we run across that river again, just let me know. Yeah. Or any source of water would be nice. I can cast prestidigitation if you want cleaning up, if that's what you're asking for the river for. Oh, that would be lovely. Okay, so cast that spell on him a few times until he's clean. Can I get in on that? Because I think I'm still covered in dragonborn guts. And now, yeah, so does a quick cleaning on you guys, blasting as all the slop just pools off, um, and soot and guts and gore just pools off, flopping onto the floor, leaving you freshly pressed and cleaned. And I guess at this point, I'm going to start looking for the exit out of this chamber. Okay. Um, make a survival check. Okay. Not great. Uh, seven. Uh, you search around. It's dark. As you're moving forward, you step into some of the dark panel eggs, quickly backing out of it. Um, it's hard to find the exit. You're going to have to move along the walls, and you haven't found it yet. Somebody want to help me look for a way out of here? Yeah, let me put the rest of my stuff away. I'll be right there. And it's, uh, what kind of check? Investigation? Um, are you guys using any lights? Uh, I've got my okay. light on my holy symbol. So when, with the light ignited, the rest of you can eventually um, take some time, pull Ellery from the pile of eggs. Um, and you do see further back, there seems to be an exit. It's not a huge hole. It looks like uh, the mine continued forward, but was partially collapsed. But it does look like the hall does continue beyond. You might have to squeeze through, but it looks like it does open up into a larger hallway. After about 15 feet or so. Shall we tarry on? Yeah, let's get going. Uh, so pushing through, sliding, kind of getting on your belly and having to crawl through for that 15 feet. You get to the other side, being able to stand up. And you're in, uh, looks like a mining shaft again, just to, similar to the tunnel that led you to this cavern. Looks about the same as the one you came in from. Continues forward and it looks like it branches off. One down to the left, one continuing forward, and then another hallway leading towards the right. Are there any signs of footprints once we kind of step out of this area, into this area? Make a survival check. Uh, a three. I see my own footprints. You do see your own footprints and they're enormous. You also see markings that lead down and to the left. Maybe I'll uh, call Ezekiel over and draw his attention to the markings and say, uh, do they look like footprints or just some kind of markings. Uh, they look like footprints. Okay. So I'll, um, Ball will get Ezekiel's attention to say, uh, Do they look like footprints? Ezekiel. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, natural one. Eight. Uh, they, they do look like footprints. <laughs> My god. So let's say you went down to the left. <laughs> nope, nope. We, we, two people failed this. Yeah, you're right, you're back. right. Oh my god. <laughs> uh, so Ball comes over, points him out. Ezekiel, you come over and yeah, these are, these are footprints. Um, and you guys go and take the left hallway going down, pushing through this hall, and it looks like it goes down for a bit and then begins a strange spiral going down. There's no staircase per se, but it kind of circles around in a corkscrew um, going down. And it continues like that for a couple minutes. After three to five minutes of going down this corkscrew, it opens up into a larger room. Uh, or a larger cavern, large enough to where you can't see the walls or the ceiling. You can hear running water. The light stretches out enough to where you can see to the left is a wall as you kind of move out into this room. Um, and to the right, as you explore a little bit, you see there's a cliff. And it ends, and over the side you can hear the water running far below. This cliff edge continues for some time. Everyone make a perception check. 
Just eleven to roll. Seven. So Amson and Ezekiel, as you guys are exploring this next room, you see a light, red reflecting faintly off the light of uh, Vesper's holy symbol. You can hear a clicking. You can hear as the lights shift. You can see something just on the edge of your vision shifting in the darkness ahead and clicking. The rest can't hear it over the sound of the water. All right. Everybody hold up a minute. I think we might have found the big bugs they were eating. What do I got? What do I got? What do I got? Uh, Ball will use uh, Divine Sense. Just a 60-foot area for uh, Celestial, Undead, and Fiend. Uh, nothing of note pings. And he'll just continue uh, kind of being on alert, listening closely. And you'll see Amson and Ezekiel have kind of like come to a stop. And they're kind of looking ahead into the darkness. Are the footprints going through this? Should we keep going ahead, or should we head back? I don't know. Can you take a look for them? I'm going to keep an eye on these creatures, and I'm just preparing a thorn whip if I see one. Okay. I'll check the ground and see if we're following the right path. Uh, make a survival check. Yeah, uh-huh, 28. Okay. As Vesper, you're looking down at the tracks. Your party has kind of created a mess from kind of exploring just this next room. You begin to pick through and try to find, okay, that's balls, that's Hillary's, and starting to sort through and see what you can find. As you're doing that, Amson and Ezekiel who are kind of looking out and have a vague idea of the, where the clicking has come from. The rest aren't really sure. You guys hear a... <laughs> the rest of you hear this as well. <laughs> and then there's this rumbling, rattling noise, and it begins to move towards you. You can feel the ground gently shaking and vibrating louder as it comes towards you. It's maybe 40 feet away. You can all hear it at this point. What do you do? And the tunnel is behind us is narrower? It is. I'm going to say go, let's go back. 30 feet. Uh, as we yeah, do, I'm ball heading... rise blade and yep. like backward step with the party. Okay. Uh, Vesper, you start to see some footprints that aren't your parties. It's hard to tell what footprints they are, and you're, the rest of your party is moving back towards the tunnels. Do you continue with them, or do you stay a couple extra seconds to see if you can identify this? How many extra seconds? Around. And it's five, 25 yeah. feet. Mm, I'll stay like five extra seconds to just like letting them go and just trying to see if I can get something last minute, but I'm not going to waste too much time if it becomes okay. dire. So you're staying? Yes. <laughs> okay. So you kind of uh, look the towards the sound of the rumbling of the tunneling moving towards you 40, 30, 25 feet, and you see your party beginning to move and pull back, and you take a step towards them, but then look down and say, all right, what is this? You see a large footprint. It doesn't seem large at first because it's narrow and long. It's not a boot. It has three toe-like appendages towards the front and one appendage towards the back. It's heavy, whatever it was, sinking into the dirt of this place. It is certainly not humanoid and certainly not any sort of shoes or boots. This is a creature of some sort. And as you look up, the ground burst before you, dirt flying, and from it, a chitinous insect burst. It steps out using two large craw claws to rip itself forward. And upon its head, there are red glowing eyes. I need everyone to make a in initiative check. <laughs> As I said that really funnily. <laughs> well, also bad. Also not the funny great. thing is, is that it's actually technically called an initiative check. You're just... Very unsure about that. He's going to make us do an intelligence check. Oh Can make we all appreciate his eagle's natural 20? Oh, natural 20. Good job. 19. <laughs> do an intelligence <laughs> check to evaluate your Sick choices it. thus far. Yeah. I love the thing where we all, like, make a whole bunch of, like, mess-ups, 
And then finally, at the very end, when it's too late to turn back, it's like, boom, natural 20. <laughs> yep. I knew it was a bad idea. He had the DM voice, but so you're staying. I'm like, all right. So you were, you were kind of like, I stay, but only just barely. And I'm like, all right, well, we'll make a choice. Yeah. She didn't say <laughs> much, so conveniently less than a quarter. Well, yeah. if nothing else, you have confirmed that this is the wrong way, and we should get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> We should probably just run, because I don't think any of us have very many spells right now, and we still have to kill the assassin guy. But that's running. table talk. <laughs> well, Mr. Let's Fight a Hydra. Um... <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so this chitinous insect bursts from the ground. As Vesper, you kind of stumble back, the rest of the party kind of shifts towards the sound, seeing Vesper not too far ahead. Her silhouette massively outmatched of this thing hulking over her. And it's maybe seven, eight feet, and it's hunched over. And as it comes up from the ground, Vesper, go ahead and make a charisma saving throw. Oh, no. Eleven. Okay. Um, We'll come back to that. (laughs) Okay, we'll come back to that. Um, Ezekiel, you're up. You turn around and you see this giant insect-like creature with red glowing eyes and Vesper kind of swaying before it. Okay, and the chamber we're in is how wide? Um, It's maybe 30 feet from left wall to cliff and then further beyond that. Okay, and the the hole we were running towards, that's only like 10 feet wide? Yeah, roughly. Okay. Uh, Well, I don't like Vesper being right next to that thing and though... George knows what it is. Ezekiel doesn't. So, uh, he's gonna do what he does and run towards Vesper and the thing. Um, Classic. yeah. And, uh, do I blow a B shape on this thing? Yeah, cause it's either that or smite and I don't want to do that. So. I'm gonna go with Giant Constrictor Snake again. It's my favorite of these tunnels. And I am going to try and, uh, constrict it. Okay, what's your speed? Is it greater than 35? Oh, he's that far away? Vesper's about 30 feet from you, but it's five more feet beyond that. Sorry, knowing that, I will go Cave Bear, which has a speed of 40 feet. Okay. So you turn, seeing, shifting, (laughs) cave bear rushing towards the creature. And I am going to try and make two attacks on it. Okay. As you rush up, you see the red eyes that almost distract you um, as you get to it. And go ahead and make an attack. Okay. Uh, No, close. And that hits. So nine piercing damage for the bite. And claws is 23. It's. 16 slashing damage. All right. Is that 16 right, or did it add a crit onto it? It oh, Just because it's auto advantage. I see, I see. Cool. Yeah, yeah. The the bear has... The bear just hits like a fucking truck. Yeah. So as this uh, this Ezekiel in bear form charges for slamming into the insect, biting in, trying to tear off some of the chitin and clawing at it, it brings up to Ellery. Uh, okay, so... I am just going to try and fling a couple of beams of Eldritch Blast at this thing. Okay. First is nine. Goes flying over his shoulder, trying to avoid the bear and Vesper. Second is a dirty 20. Dirty 20 slams into it. You can see the chitin being morphed and cracking under the force. And that's seven points of force damage. All right. You stay in there, Ellery? Uh, yeah, I'm going to stay where I am. Okay. Uh, Vesper, I need you to roll a d8 for me. Can we do that in the chat for me? Oh, no, it's fine. Oh, it's fine. Just tell uh, me. Seven. Okay. Make an attack modifier for me. An attack. Okay. Um, so the rapier, so it is a 13. Does that hit a cave bear? Yes, does it does. Count? Okay. Okay. So, uh, Vesper, your mind melds and you strike out, wow. just trying to hit something. Now I do max into... damage. Now I do max damage. That's 12 piercing damage. Okay. Into Ezekiel's bear form. 
Cool. As if you're not prepared for this to defend against it, and suddenly you find the rapier digging into your side and lungs, you pulling really think out. I'm not prepared um, for the party to damage me at this point. Should I? <laughs> I hate myself. Do I roll sneak attack? Um, I'd like to not do that, but if I must, it is something I have. I'm gonna say no. It's, okay, thank you. You're not using your full ability. It's just you're swinging wildly. You're confused. I enjoy that. Thank you. Okay. And that's all you do. And that will bring us to it that is going to now attack the cave bear as well. That is a 21 to hit the cave bear. Yeah. And a 15 to hit. Yep. Okay, so the claw comes down dealing 13 slashing damage. Okay. And then it reaches down with these huge mandibles clawing towards your neck. Dealing 17 slashing damage as it bites in and then rips off some of the flesh and fur. Yep, just enough to drop my form. And as it lifts you up, you shift form and you fall from its mandibles landing on the ground in humanoid form once more. And that is going to stay where it is. This can bring us up to ball. I think Melly goes before me. She's got better decks than I do. Oh, Melly. And, uh, Melly, as you begin to go, you all begin to hear clicking, echoing in this cavern and more tunneling beginning to move in your direction. Melly. I'm going to attempt to cast. Oh, wait, that was what we were expecting to. I'm going to ray across the thing. Okay. The Arshide or Ice Shard flies through the air. But it's. 23. Cool. Slamming into her shoulder is knocking it off balance, dealing ten. Nice. Is that it for you, Billy? Yes. That brings us up to Ball. So Ball's going to kind of catch back up to the party. Can Ball get within ten? Because I've got a twenty-five move speed. Can Ball get within ten feet of this um, creature? Just, per- just barely, but yeah. Okay, so Ball will do that, and then Ball's going to uh, attack with Reach. Um, okay. Can't do no magic stuff, but I will just have a reach. A 13? So you rush up, striking over Vesper's head, and you hit into the chitin, but you are not able to pierce it. It's like striking into heavy armor. Okay, and I think that's all I can do, really. So that's the end of my turn. And that'll bring us up to Amson. As Ball, you see the red lights in the eyes, and you feel something buzzing in your mind. Amson. Uh, okay. So how far am I away from it? You are 35 feet from it. Okay. Vicious Mockery is 60 feet, so I'm going to viciously mock this weird creature Satan that's in front of Vesper. That's a three. All right, so it fails. And uh, Amson is going to yell, um, Hey, why don't you just bug off? <laughs> and, uh, hey, that's Max. So that is, what, eight? Eight psychic damage, and it has disadvantage on its next attack. Okay. And are you staying there, Amson? Assuming so, unless you tell me otherwise, Ezekiel comes back around to you. You can feel the strange buzzing in your mind as you look into the distracting red gaze of the creature, this insect before you. What do you do? Awesome. I'm confused. Okay. Uh, so make a charisma saving throw. No, I already did. I, I rolled oh. a oh boy. <laughs> or <Okay>. three. Okay. <laughs> so roll a d8 for me. Great, 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 great. Three. Uh, so you stare, blinking, unmoving, staring at the red eyes of the insect. That brings us up to Ellery. Okay, what the fuck is happening? And I will... Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and cast Fireball at this thing. Or centered, I guess, centered a little bit behind it so that it doesn't hit my friends. It's going to be hard to do so. Give, give me a, just give me a spell check. Just to, a spell attack. Okay. Natural 20. Okay, yeah. Yeah, you, you, your friends are positioned, we're doing theater of the mind, so your yeah. friends are positioned in such a way to where you can just barely see a point beyond where you might be able to do so. Okay. So, uh, deck save for it. Uh, natural one. Nice. Let me make sure I have enough D6s. Okay. 
10, 20, 25. 30 points of fire damage. As a little bead of ember explodes in flames and burning up the back of the creature as it clicks and rise in pain. Um, are you staying there, Ellery? Uh, yes. Okay. And Vesper, that comes back up to you. You kind of snap out of it as you look around. You see um, Ezekiel just staring blankly up towards the red eyes of this insect, and you have a rapier in your hand with blood spilt upon it. Cool. Do I have time to cheat the rapier and then cast a spell? Uh, make a Christmas save. Fuck. Mm, bad. Very bad. Five. Make a D8. You uh, four. You begin to start to sheath the rapier, and then your hand just falls to the side as you're staring in this, the lights twinkling behind the red eyes. It's coming to it. Fire is still burning up. These tendrils that kind of come out of it, flaming on the chitin and moss that grows upon it, and it steps back, turns, and dives into the tunnel where it burst up from and begins tunneling. <laughs> back. Ball, you would be the only person that gets an attack of opportunity on this. As Ezekiel and Vesper are stuck. Um, okay, I will do a uh, Burning Blade attack with my Warcaster feet. Or wait, is he... He's ten feet. Yeah. Okay, so I can't do that. I just do a regular attack. So, I can do a natural twenty. Yeah. Two damage. I'm going to add a smite into it, because why not? And... Just because I'm also going to make it my highest slot, so that's a zero, or a fourth level. And let me just get my abacus out. Uh, fourth level smite is going to be 5d8, doubled, and this is going to be whatever this is. So 16 plus 5, uh, 10d8. 42 damage plus 16, so 58 damage. Yeah, so as Ezekiel and Vesper just staring at its blinking eyes... How do you how do you kill this thing? Is this turning to try to escape and run away? Still on fire from the moss. I think it's actually something about it. It doesn't really look that impressive necessarily. It's just like uh, as it turns away, Ball kind of notices some kind of like hole in the armor, some kind of weakness, and then just digs the glaive in there. And when he does, and feels like he's actually penetrated through the armor, just kind of thrusts a little deeper, and with it, kind of channels his smite into it. Sure. So unceremoniously just strikes towards where the spine would be, finding it twisting, and then a shimmer of silver light kind of runs down your weapon as it blasts into it. The cracks in the chitin, where the the chitinous shells kind of overlap, light kind of flows out of it before it falls into the hole it was trying to escape into, unmoving. Vesper and Ezekiel kind of come to once more looking around, seeing Ball still positioned, holding the glaive in front, still looking down, seeing the dead insect before you, as you all hear, and can see one, two, three, four sets of red eyes that are moving towards you. You can hear of tumbling coming towards you as well. Yeah, let's let's get the fuck out of here. Turning, running, moving back towards the hallway, and then the corkshoe uh, rushing up. Um, as we run, Ball will throw his last set of caltrops behind him. Okay. Throwing those, digging into your pocket, throwing them on the ground behind you as you move up. Um, everyone give me an athletics check. Oh, nice. Oh. 14 for Vesper. 18 for Ball. 7, Seven for Ellery. Ooh, go Melly. 20. Damn. All right. Um, so you guys are able to push forward up the fairly narrow corkshoe, rushing forward a few kind of trip along the way. But as they do, Ezekiel and Amson and Ball kind of lift, and Melly grabs and almost lifts someone back up to their feet. Mallory, <laughs> almost fireman style, before it kind of gets you back on the feet, continuing to run as you corkscrew up. You can hear the sound behind you still continuing, um, but you've gained some distance as you come out of the corkscrew and kind of back to that intersection where there was left and down, where you just came back from, forward and then the other direction towards the right. You're, you're kind of back where you were. You have a little bit of distance, but this, the noise is still coming towards you. What do you do? Which way do we go? Not back the way we came. So it was the only way. Let's just go. So there's there's two. There's towards the dark mantles, towards the insects, and then there's two other options. Oh, I thought there was only one. Uh, Ball licks his finger, 
feels where the wind is coming from. It goes that way. How there's quick, no wind. Yeah. How quickly can I do a Yeah, you look check? at that tunnel, I'll look at this one. Okay. Okay, both of you guys make survival checks as you quickly. Odd. 23. 13. Uh. Ezekiel, insect track, insect track, insect track. Best for as you're searching, nothing, 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 something. Out of nowhere. There's no steps leading up to. Suddenly there are two footprints as if they just landed here. I got him. And they this continue way. forward. This way. Okay, let's you go. Rush down towards the hallway, towards the right, as you kind of continue forward, following that trail, rushing. Uh, give me, um, as you're kind of rushing down this, everyone give me a constitution check. As you're kind of trying to outrun and prevent exhaustion running from these creatures. That one. So as you guys are pushing forward and continuing, a few of you are able to keep running, jogging, pacing yourself. A few of you are starting to get winded. Uh, Melly, uh, exhausted from lifting someone off their ass, uh, as it begins to hit you. You can see you're almost doubled over, gr- clutching your side from cramping as you've been jogging for a few minutes. The noise has died down somewhat. As you are, are jogging, do you guys continue to jog and push past? You might feel that some of you may start to gain exhaustion levels if you jog. We might wake up something worse moving forward. I can w- use a spell and hopefully get them off our trail, but it's one of my bigger ones that I have left. Do you think there's... I think you can spare it. Do you think they're still following? I don't know. Creatures like that can probably track via tremors. Just keep a good place. I'll save it until the last moment. Speedwalk. Okay. So you guys are slowing down from a jog into a yes. speedwalk. Okay. Um, as you do so, the sound behind you has definitely quieted down. Every now and then you hear them. It kind of echoes through the halls, but is they're not currently right on your tail. You put some distance between you, but they're still clearly in the vicinity. Um, as you continue to move forward through these mines. And as you do so, continuing through these tunnels, you come upon ground, solid stone, tiles. For the last couple minutes as you were jogging, you were no longer in a mining shaft where it looks like there was numerous corridors and the remains of structures to hold up the columns, but in more of just a natural tunnel. And you've hit into something where there are stone tiles. Continuing forward, it becomes a hallway. Pushing forward, it opens up into a larger room, but this room is square with right angles in the corners. It is maybe not man-made, but made by something. It's not natural. There are tiles on the ground. You see carved and shaped stone reliefs along the sides. You can see inscriptions in the stones in this art deco styling. As you continue forward, there are maybe hallways that have collapsed. There's rubble. You continue into a larger room, and you see bodies. Maybe four, four and a half feet tall in some places. Some armor remains, old, mostly rusted, covered in dust. You can see script writing above doorways that lead into the next room. Uh, written in a script that looks dwarvish. For those of you who speak it, it's not quite dwarvish, but it's close enough to where you can roughly translate it. It seems to say trade den, or place of trade, or hole of trade, something like that. Continuing into this room, you see it opens up into a space where you can't see the ceiling and you can't see the walls. But you do see numerous columns. Almost a forest of them that extends before you. You can see these columns have now dwarvish depictions, statues that stand upon pedestals holding the rest of the column above them. The same Art Deco style through the rest of it. Any idea what this place is that we've come into? I mean, Naminet was born on top of other civilization. Didn't we learn something about that? This is probably just. The remnants of some former civilization, perhaps a dwarvish one that lived underneath. Perhaps it was here before they moved Naminet from the last world. I don't really know how the order of things went, but obviously there used to be something below the earth. Uh, It doesn't, and this might be a stretch, but at all look like the place where we fought uh, that 
woman who turned into a banshee where we were trying to save the people. I don't even remember what that was, but I just know we were underground and we found yeah. something. And oh, we, the catacombs? Yeah, we chased Eliza through the catacombs. Yeah, they, it doesn't look like that, does it? There's columns. I mean, there's some similarities in that it's underground and there's columns, but That's the columns kind of here thing. have dwarven statues and art deco design, and the columns there were very simple. You okay. say no. <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's just been a while. Anyway. All right, just checking. Yeah, I don't have anything. Okay. As as you guys move out of this room, there is a large hallway. It looks like a grand entrance. There's a large dwarvish, something like dwarvish script above. Part of it is the pieces fallen and destroyed, but it looks like the name of some location or city. Arkra. And then the rest of the word is gone. This hallway grand entrance of sorts has numerous reliefs on both sides of what looks like dwarves and other human looking individuals and some other individuals you can see one in particular has in the center a dwarf with a body with strong cheek lines as if they were carved a beard and you can see in the veins of the arms and upon the face and the eyes Gold has been molded into it, as if veins. To the left, there is a human-looking individual. The eyes have two emerald gems in the sockets. And to the right of the dwarf is a smaller, shorter, lanky individual. You think halfling at first because of the size, but not quite halfling. Bald, large, dark eyes. A goatee, wearing robes, ornate with a staff. There are a few other depictions similar in nature along both sides with various ores of gold and silver and platinum and iron and gems in the eyes, emeralds, rubies, opals. I kind of slow Look. down looking at the gems in the eyes, but I don't stop. But anybody who happens to look in my direction can tell that I'm tempted. Is there an obvious direction to proceed through here? Yes. It doesn't take you long to realize this feels like a grand entrance. Like this is where visitors and newcomers would come through. And it displayed on the sides of these reliefs are clearly leaders of some sort, important people of some sort. And each relief has a single dwarf, a single human, and a single... You're not sure. Maybe halfling. It's, it's hard to say what they are. And looking ahead, you can see what looks like a gate of marbled stone. You can see slots where there are alcoves and humanoid figures sitting in them. As you get closer, it's, you can see more details of them. To the right, there are windows, almost like cashier windows. You can see them open and looking in, it looks like a front desk, an entrance desk of some sort. And as you look ahead, you can see there's something on the ground. You've been passing a, a few bodies every now and then, but there's something else on the ground. A spider-like structure made of metal. Looking at it, it seems to be, it looks like marbled stone, gray and black, silver sharpened edges. This spider made out of this marble stone, feeling it has the weight and heft and density of metal. You can see a complex mechanism of gears inside. And at this point, as you're inspecting this and looking ahead towards the gate, you can see in those alcoves, those humanoid figures are constructs similar to the spider, but standing in their alcoves, unmoving, but standing. You can see they have a shield in one arm, and the other doesn't hold a hammer, but the arm is a hammer. What do you do? Let's, uh... Not touch anything at all. Yeah. I'll keep an eye out for any, like, movement or tripwires, I guess. Or anything like that. Okay. Uh, make a perception check. Yes, sir. 18. Okay. Uh, looking around, you don't see any tripwires, any glyphs, or anything like that. This place is mostly covered in dust, and there hasn't been much movement. There are spider webs in the corners, maybe insects, but not much else comes down here. 
you can notice where dust has been cleared around the alcoves and around the vicinity of that gate that is currently closed. Those things have probably moved, at least fairly recently. It's hard to tell when, but at least fairly recently. Could have been a couple weeks, a month, but it's not as still as the rest of this place. Hey, any of you see signs of footprints? I'll take a peek. Okay, I guess we're all check. Uh, dirty 20. Okay. You notice here the footsteps aren't as hidden. They seem sure of themselves here. They're walking instead of trying to stealth or run. Um, and because of the thick layer of dust throughout most of this area, it's pretty easy to follow. And they go up to the, that entrance stands and then move up to there before continuing forward towards the closed gate. Uh, can I follow those? And hands behind my back, I'm not touching anything. See the patterns in the dust if something looks like it's been pulled or touched or pushed. Within the entrance gate area? Yeah. Yeah, okay. following the footsteps, like retracing yeah. the, the So looking through the window, it looks like this is there's clearly a desk set up. There's a two stone chairs, one of them overturned, and there's a layer of dust as if it hasn't been touched. Um, upon the desk, there is a lever, a gear placed there. Looking at it, it's hard to tell how much dust there is. There's some dust on it. Okay. The, well, the gear itself is made out of that same marbled stone that the spider and those guardian constructs seem to be made out of. Right. So he's more confident here, clearly knows the place. I'm not sure if this is what I should pull. I'm not going to touch anything too hastily. But the footprints go into the gate, and this is where they lead before that. So it seems like the best option. But I don't want to pull the wrong thing and wake these guys up. Well, let's maybe have... Well, first, how much distance is there between the gate and this alcove that Vesper is looking at? Yeah, so there's... The furthest away from you is the gate and its bar. So you can see through it and see the hallway continues beyond it. Mm -hmm. um, the gate itself is made out of that marble metal, whatever that is. Coming towards you from the gate, there are the alcoves where there are four of those construct guards. Oh, yeah. And then in front of that, closer towards you, is the entrance, sort of the entrance cashier's check-in station. Yeah, th that's what I meant. Um, how much, uh, yes. like, how many feet between the gate and the the lever? Probably about 40-ish feet, something like that. Okay, so... Maybe if most of us gather over by the gate and be ready to go through, somebody can pull the lever and then, if we have to, make a run for it. Who feels like being fast today? Can I go up to that area and roll investigation to see if I can figure out how to work this stuff? Uh, to the entrance check-in station? Yeah, to like the gate yeah. where the levers are and things like yeah. that. Yeah, make an investigation check. All right. It's a 17. Uh, looks like you would pull it down. It seems like a pretty simple mechanism. I'll say with that, you can still look around. It looks like this is a check-in station. You can see um, metal boxes that look like they stored information that has long since passed. A few stone tablets that look like there's information carved into it. Okay, but I... I, I basically just get the impression that this looks fairly straightforward then. Yeah, it does look straightforward. Maybe we just pull it and go in. Oh, for the love of fuck, pull the lever! <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm by the lever. I'll put my hand on it, wait till everyone gets to the gate. <laughs> I'll just be queen of bad decisions today. It's fine. Okay. Um, as okay. you grab the lever and your friends move towards the gate, the rest of you, as you move towards the gate, there is a a line that is faintly, almost like a very half-inch speed bump that kind of marks the beginning of the alcoves. And as you cross that line, eyes of glowing gemstones ignite on the four construct guards. They don't move, but they ignite as you cross that line and move towards the gate. Pull the lever. The bars... That are thick, maybe 
four inches in diameter each, slide into the ground, opening up the gate. Great. We hurry through. Okay, yep, let's... Moving towards the gate, crossing beyond it, uh, you continue down the hall, kind of watching over your shoulders. The glowing gemstones of the guards remain ignited until the gate slowly (laughs) closes once more after about a minute or so, and then the gemstones fade. Great. Do we see more of the same? Yeah. As as you guys continue down this hallway, it isn't too long before you hear a a clicking, and you see a similar spider you saw before, but not destroyed. Um, it seems to be picking up a piece of stone and moving it, shifting it, carrying it somewhere else. You can see now tracks on the ground that are leading back towards the gate. And as you continue forward, the tracks lead towards two open doorways, a left one and a right one. To the left, there is a floor. And to the right, there is no floor. The right doorway has bars similar to the gate before. You can see through and see a pit, like an elevator shaft. On the left, you can see the floor and an open gate leading to this large elevator shaft. The tracks actually lead towards it. You can see now inside the elevator shaft, there are carts, kind of like mining carts, um, that are able to be followed the track into the elevator shaft itself. Well, seems like there's only one way to go. Well... As we continue on, hopefully we'll start catching up soon. He's got to be resting at some point. Uh, maybe as we're walking, like Ball's going to just occasionally, once he's not admiring the new scenery, um, just try to take a look on the ground and see if he notices any kind of footprints that do look like they're not from around here. Sure. Uh, make a investigation or perception check. And as he does so, he's going to encourage kind of the party as well. Oh, you sure. someone with it's a higher skill check. <laughs> Get in on this. <laughs> oh, Can you blame me? So you said investigation or perception. I'll do perception. Uh, it'll be a natural one. So I will um, repeat myself and say, hey, everyone else with a better roll. <laughs> I mean, Vesper found the footprints earlier, so uh, yeah, I'm more concerned about good. threats right now. Okay, well, Ball will continue just to keep an eye out to see it, because I assume... We don't really know where this guy's gone, so if there's any other kind of clue that appears at some point, though, with Ball's natural one, Ball won't be seeing any of those clues anyway. You're you're looking around and and aren't seeing any footsteps. Vesper tries to point it out to you a few times, and you kind of maybe see it, but it's hard to see. But there does seem to be an elevator shaft that goes down. Or up. Probably not up, because there's a ceiling. Looking into the pit on the right shaft, looking down, you don't see a bottom. It just fades to black, as far as your vision will allow. Is there any sign of anything that might move those bars, another lever? There is a lever inside of the elevator shaft. So there's a column in the center that seems to control the elevator shaft. You don't see any other lever. So am I, I'm not sure if I'm visualizing things correctly. So there's an empty elevator shaft with a pit going down. And then there's another one that's actually, that has the floor that's present. Yeah. So it looks like there's basically two elevator shafts. One has the elevator basically open on your floor, doors open. And the other one, the whatever level the elevator is at, is not on this level. And there's bars preventing you from jumping into the empty pit. And the footsteps were going to one of them? They head towards the right one, towards the currently empty one. Okay. Well, do you think they... There, you said there was a mine shaft? Sorry. The the cart tracks lead and split and go towards the okay. elevator shafts themselves. And the elevator that's open, there's actually tracks that lead onto it and circle around, and there are carts on the elevator shaft. This This isn't some rudimentary track system. This the tracks that are there and the carts that are there look to be of high quality, though very old. We get on the elevator. Getting on all the one last and just kind of make sure it supports his weight as he does it. Seems to be completely fine. Um, there's a 
the floor itself is circular and the center is a column that leads up and there's actually stairs to the left and the right that lead up to sort of a balcony staging where there are benches. Um, you can see benches and what looks like where beds were, though whatever cushioning or cloth is no longer there. In the center is a lever, and hooked into the lever is a crystal, a long and thin crystal that's kind of driven into it, like placed into a slot, like a key in the ignition. Does anyone know how to work this? I would assume like a lever? Well, we'll begin to pull it like a lever. Okay. You push it up, and the elevator breaks, and you'll fall to your gut. <laughs> now, you, you pull it down. And as you do, there's a, and you can hear gears turning and twisting. And as they do, bars, just like the gate before, close, leaving you inside of the elevator itself, kind of locked in. And there's a clicking, releasing of locks. And there, then the elevator begins to descend. I wonder if he's close enough to hear that. I wonder if anyone's been doing repairs on this elevator for the last century. I was trying not to think of that, Ezekiel. Thank you. The elevator descends until you can no longer see the top. I presume you're using some light, but at a certain point you can no longer see the top. And the edges of the floor come right up to the circular edge of the wall. There are places where there are gears placed and columns where you can kind of get a glimpse over the edge, a little crack, but it just seems black as far as you can see down. And it descends. Ten minutes go by. Thirty minutes. Is An hour. Has elevator music. No music. Every now and then you, you hear the gears constant. And every now and then you hear clanging and echoing of metal from above you and below and from somewhere surrounding you. And it continues. An hour goes by. How Two. far down does this fucking thing go, I say, after the first 20 minutes? Yeah, if it's uh, past 20 minutes, I'm going to start yes. trying to take a rest. Mm -hmm. okay. Like sitting on the floor. Just... Okay. That would explain the beds. Yeah, the... maybe shape that. Sorry. <laughs> you guys rest, sit, look around, and the elevator continues. Two hours past. Four hours passed. Five. At a certain point, you hear a clicking ch -ch 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 -ch, and see one of those metal spiders that comes up and it moves towards the carts and it shifts some of the wheels. It has these sort of these metal legs and there are where the mandibles would be. You see instead bristles almost of steel wool or some, some sort. They kind of whir and spin, cleaning wheels, getting into the gears for claws or before it crawls and kind of shifts onto the underside of the elevator. Eight hours pass. Uh, suddenly, at some point, yep. we would have, like, maybe taken turns trying to take a nap or something. Yeah, yeah I real. think so. Like, sure. you know, it's seven hours and 36 minutes, and we're like, all right, now let's start a short rest. <laughs> I mean, rest. I think after if the we, first hour, it's like, okay, time to just I mean, at least a short rest, but I don't know that I would be comfortable taking a long rest. We don't know when it's going to stop. Well, we could start to. It's light then, activity is... Categorizes resting, so as long as we're not, you know, trying to knit quilts and whatever, we can. All right. I think after like a couple hours, Ball will look to the party and maybe point out the ones that look the most kind of worn out and say, if this continues, it might be better to make use of the beds, get some rest. And if the, you know, if we don't manage to get a full rest in there, then so be it. But okay. like, I doubt we're going to be staring at a wall for eight hours. You guys could certainly begin or attempt to take a long rest? Or is anyone staying up? Or are you all just going to take turns? I think we should probably take turns. Yeah, same like if we're on the road. Okay. Um, so you guys take turns. And for those of you who are watching, every now and then you'll see one of these spiders crawl off from beneath or onto the wall, and it moves over and it cleans something and it shifts away. But otherwise, the whirring continues. And after about eight hours or so, there's a brief dim flash of arcane energy as Melly, something falls onto your lap, a letter that has been added to your roll 20 inventory. And as you open it up to read and the elevator continues to roll down, 
Now we're going to go ahead and take our break here and come back. 9.55? Does that work for you guys? You give me a letter and then go to a break. That is so mean. <laughs> it gives you a chance to read it and decide what you want to do. Okay. Next time on Back to the Story. This is an arcane rune of a necromatic spell to raise the dead on the skeleton. Ouch. As a dagger slams into the back and materializing there is a man hooded and cloaked. They see things differently from way up there in their heaven. They do not see the dust we must breathe in day after day. In the darkness, absence of light. What did I do to deserve it? For part two of this episode of Back to the Story, you can find it on Stitcher, Google Play, Player FM, or TuneIn. We also have a YouTube channel called Back to the Story, an actual play podcast. If you'd like to support the show, feel free to buy us a coffee at ko-fi.com slash backtothestory.